the project Edible Estates, which um, which I've been working on for the past couple of years, didn't grow entirely out of the art world, and it didn't grow entirely out of a background, a deep professional background in horticulture either, because that isn't, I'm, re I'm really not qualified in that. Symbolically, I liked originally this idea of doing a project in the geographic center of the country as a way to leave the kind of cultural ghettos of New York and LA and go to the center. My focus went to the front lawn, which is it's a space that I grew up in the suburbs of Minneapolis mowing and thinking about. In doing the Edible Estates book, it was very interesting to go back and explore the history of it and understand how we ended up with this kind of absurd space everywhere. Um, and its roots really go back to um, English manor estates. And you can see that the lawn is used as this very ornamental space that's meant to demonstrate wealth. Because instead of growing food on this valuable land, you're showing you're so rich. You're not going to grow food there. You're going to use it to present your great house. And then food is hidden from view, the production of it. So that's really the beginning of this notion that plants that produce food are ugly and meant to be hidden. And the thing that's meant to put in front of the house is this ornamental kind of um, sterile landscape. Immediately after the war, there's this amazing abrupt shift that happens from the war to the 50s and or late 40s, where we go from, I think, 80% of Americans growing some amount of food in their own property to the 50s, where there is a real concerted commercial industrial attempt to sell the lawn to the American public. Like that is the proper way to live and to, to surround your house. So the lawn um, took off in the 50s with high, you know, skyrocketing home ownership, availability of fresh water, cheap gas, industrialized chemicals, like all these new housing developments that were be, being built for the returning um, troops. Coming from architecture, I'm also think about it really spatially, like if you divide up a house into functions, you have a place for sleeping and a place for eating and cooking, and that's where our focus is and where we live, then what happens to that space around our house? And currently it's really regarded by most people as this um, pretty powerful moat that protects you from anything else around. Edible Estates has a lot to do with reconsidering how we connect to each other through you know, how we use that space. What is my relationship to my community if I surround myself with a lawn versus if I surround myself with a space where I'm growing food or something like that? Um, and I think the reason the front lawn is so interesting is because whatever you do there is a public declaration of some sort. It demonstrates, you know, either that you want to eliminate your identity by taking on something else, like some sort of Georgian facade or something, or appropriating some historical period, you know, style that's, you know, it's like totally Hollywood stage set pastiche because you go around to the back of the house and that whole facade falls apart. So these stories that we tell other people about who we are in terms of what we do in our front yard, I think, are interesting. And, you know, I, you know there's always the um, really amazing eccentric people in every neighborhood that, that, um, Take, anyway. Yeah, that take, you know, advantage of how public it is and make these amazing displays. And I'm sure every neighborhood has one, you know, where they totally embrace that idea of having a public spectacle in their front yard. Um, and then there's other people who want to minimize it as much as possible and reveal as little of themselves as they can. Hundreds of years ago, if you lived in a city, you had a pretty good sense of what your impact was on the landscape, but also what, what was the byproduct of your consumption, what we now call consumption, which is just about everything. And also a few hundred years ago, you were more aware probably of where all your waste went because it didn't travel so far. So things, you, you use resources immediately around you, um, and your waste kind of ended up immediately around you. Now that spread out to such a global effect, like we have no idea um, how much the $5 t-shirt really costs because its, costs, its real costs are hidden from us and we're not really able to experience them. And um, you know, obviously when we throw something away, we have no sense of where that goes either. It's all meant to be hidden from us as effectively as possible. 
So what happens to a society when the society is no longer aware of their impact on the world they're living in? I'm, all of my projects, I'm highly thoughtful about who is experiencing it and what kind of, um, what their experience is and how it opens itself up to a lot of different audiences. Like I would want my aunt in Minnesota to be um, able to experience my work on some level the same way um, an art critic in New York could. They're both gonna look at it in different ways, expecting different things and evaluate it differently, but I want, I want to make work that really engages like a really, really broad populace. And I think it's possible. I mean, when I was younger, I was very skeptical of this and kind of confused about it. Like how, and I think a lot of students are, as a matter of fact, like how do you make work that operates at the highest level of your intellect, you know, that really engages all of these things that you care about and think about, but at the same time, um, doesn't become sort of sort of elitist form that's talking to 40 people that are, have access to the same books you do or something. Mm -hmm. Edible Estates and actually the next project that I'll be doing, which is called Animal Estates, Making Homes for Animals. Um, they're, you know, usually the projects, you can sum them up in a sentence and even a child can understand them and maybe even get kind of excited about them. But then hopefully as you, as it's considered contextually from different points of view, it can be read in different ways. So even with the Edible Estates project, it's been written about so uh, so often in non-art magazines or journals or newspapers that don't even contextualize it as art. It's just a project. It's just something that's happening or it's a movement. You know, people are doing it in different cities and not really aware where it, calling it edible estates and not really aware where it came from or that it comes from an art context and that's fine. Like, I love the idea that a project can start in the art world and then go off into the world without needing that identity anymore. And I think the art world is a really fertile, like beautiful free space to um, produce projects like that. This idea that it could even extend into a public that's not even aware of how it's meant to be understood. Like for some people it's a garden project, for others it's a political project, or it's a project about food, or it's about community, or it's an art project related to some history of earth art. Like, with each person, they're bringing their own kind of expectations, and I don't want to shut any one of those down too much, really. The projects are really growing and developing beyond anything I've done before this year, um, and they're happening all over the place. The first one will be um, the garden at Descanso, which is a public demonstration garden. Previously, all the gardens I've done before have been in private front lawns. So I like that directness of working with one family on their private property doing a project that is then public because of where it is. Um, in the case of the garden for Descanso, it's this interesting challenge where they have this center circle, which is their main um, kind of center featured planting area. And um, so they've commissioned an edible estates demonstration garden. And I think they get something like 3,000 people through in a day in the summer. So it'll have this wonderful visibility in the way, you know, none of the projects I've done before, very few people see them. In this case, a lot of people will experience it firsthand. So I'm more interested in having it be <clears throat> a real functioning demonstration garden because it is this amazing institutional garden. They have the resources to really keep it up and looking amazing so people can see what's really possible in an edible garden, like how beautiful it can be. But for this center circle, I'll be dividing in half. There'll be kind of a ghost of a house in the middle, which will just be tension wire um, box kind of. That will be a trellis on one side for edibles, like um, grapes and things like that to grow on it. <clears throat> so one half of the oval will be planted with edibles, this kind of really dense garden. And on the other side will be a lawn. And there'll be some sort of graphics to tell the story of, of um, what's happening on each side, how much water each side needs, what each side produces in terms of pollution or food. Um, and then there'll be this really clear moment of reckoning where people can see this choice of two ways of occupying land, really, and what the byproducts are of each and what each has to offer. And, um, you know, just aesthetically, too, I think, um, it'll be interesting to see the contrast between the two things. Yeah.